Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Christina Nosti, the Events and Marketing Director at Miami's independently owned bookstore, Books and Books, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with the great Colson Whitehead to celebrate the paperback publication of his novel, Harlem Shuffle. A favorite among critics and readers, Harlem Shuffle has garnered rave reviews and has been listed as one of the best books of the year by Time, NPR, Washington Post, Book Page, Kirkus Reviews, Publishers Weekly, Oprah Daily, and the New York Times Book Review. Tonight's event would not be possible without the generous participation of our hosts, Miami Book Fair, and the active partnership of our many independent bookstore colleagues throughout the US. I'll be posting our partnering bookstore names and website information in the chat, so please be sure to give them some love and hats off to all of you. Colson Whitehead is the number one New York Times bestselling author of 10 works of fiction and nonfiction and is a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction for The Nickel Boys and The Underground Railroad, which also won the National Book Award. A recipient of MacArthur and Guggenheim Fellowships, he lives in New York City. To moderate this evening's conversation, we're joined by Adam Serwer, a staff writer for the Ideas section of The Atlantic and the author of the New York Times bestselling essay collection, The Cruelty is the Point. He was previously the national editor at BuzzFeed News, a national reporter for MSNBC, and a reporter for Mother Jones. Please remember that throughout this evening's broadcast, you can post your questions for the author in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, and we thank you for supporting independent bookstores. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hello. How do you do? <laughs> How are you doing? Uh, pretty good. Yeah, it's been a very nice summer, getting some working and some chilling. Uh, trying to get my driver's license, so I've been hitting the road with my oh, driving yeah. instructor. <laughs> so is this the first time you would be getting a driver's license? This is a very New York thing. It's my first license, but I took driver's ed when I was 16. And I got my learner's permit like 10 years ago and kind of drove around but never followed through. But now my wife just really hates me for not, not participating in all the chores. So this year this, is the year. This is a very wonderful New York thing that you can live your entire life without ever having a driver's license because there's so much public transportation. Like in Texas, you can't really do this. I mean, I guess if you, you, you can travel by horseback, I don't know. But uh, here it would be very difficult um, to live your life if you could not drive a car. No, yeah, no, it's, it is... Uh... I succeeded, but now like learning to drive in your in your fifties in New York City is definitely a different experience. You know, like feels very intense. I have like a, my driving instructor has like me and like a bunch of sixteen year old girls <laughs> as, as students, and he's always yelling at me. Like having to yell this much since like my dad was alive. Like he's just you know always like so. I one hundred percent think that you should write something short about this. I'm not kidding. Like well, that's my daughter not just... <laughs> is 17, and at one point we we're maybe going to take classes together, but that was too much of a sitcom. So. Yeah, that that is very much like a a, a 30 minute sitcom episode premise. Yeah. Um. So moving on to the the book, the reason that we're here, um, I, I guess we'll, I'll just start off by asking, you know, what what movies or books did you use as an inspiration for the Harlem Shuffle while you were writing it? Well, yeah, there's all, you know, a lot of things. I, I want to thank you uh, for talking to me and, and everybody for tuning in. Books and Books, Miami Book Fair for hosting and all the bookstores across the country. Thanks so much. Maybe I'll see you in person next time. That'd be cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, like the heist story is definitely a, a, a film one. You know, that's my, that was my biggest source material. Um, uh, there's like the, the high end, Ocean's Eleven type heist, and then the lo-fi heist of like the killing or asphalt jungle. Um, I definitely lean towards those sort of very sweaty, low technology ones. Um, so what is it that like appeals the, about those? Oh, sorry? What is it that appeals about the less, the, the, the sort of low tech versions of the heist story? I think like in Ocean's Eleven sort of cheating when you can get like a, 
million dollar EMP device to knock out all the security in Las Vegas. It just seems kind of, you know, I really putting the effort in. Um, but there's that those all those great sequences in, in heist movies where they're casing the place or you know trying to break in, timing the guards, uh, making sure that the alarms are off, and just that meticulous uh, kind of dedication to detail um, when you know it's all going to go wrong. Usually, um, the the getaway driver is like drunk or something, and the safe cracker's wife has been cheating on him, and he's all jangly. So all that planning um, that they put into comes to nothing and half the crew will die in a shootout and the other half will um, give up a lot of their earnings to the fence who takes all their, all their, all their stolen material at a, at a, a lower grade. Um, you know, many not, many, although obviously not all of your novels has been set in and around New York City. Um, you know, what makes you keep coming back to it as sort of a setting or a muse? It is, my, you know, it's my hometown and I keep finding, I keep failing to nail it. I think if I got it right, I could stop, but um, I haven't really figured out how to do it perfectly yet. So um, I've tried different things. The intuitionist uh, attacks the city in an allegorical way. Um, zone one is kind of a utopian New York. Everyone's dead. You can get a cab. There's no one in line in front of you at the grocery store. And then there's a super realistic version of Harlem Shuffle. And so I like that I just, I get so much sustenance creatively from my city and I keep finding different ways to talk about it. And so it's, it's really been fertile ground. So Harlem Shuffle is a heist novel set mostly during the civil rights movement or, or during the civil rights movement, but the, the characters themselves are sort of mostly indifferent sometimes even to the point of humor, even though they're affected and involved in related, related, related events. And I'm saying it that way because I don't want to spoil anything for anybody who hasn't read it yet. But you know, how did you come up with the setting and how the characters relate to it? Was it more interesting to write about sort of you know, bystanders, so to speak, since most people were not you know, civil rights activists or something adjacent? Yeah, well, yeah, I'm always trying to inhabit my characters, whether they're heroes or villains, um, slaves or slave masters. You know, I have to animate the slave catcher is going to get a lot of page time in the Underground Railroad. And I have to figure out what my, you know, criminal types feel about the civil rights movement. You know, there are people who are engaged and definitely the younger generation is engaged in that final section where there's a protest over police brutality. There are people who are indifferent. There are people who work 12 hours a day and can't think of it. People have been so beaten down um, by racial injustice that they can't even conceive of what's coming in 1964, 65, or maybe they know better than we do because <laughs> we, we've reverted so much. Um, and so, you know, it's not my duty to make sure every, make sure all my characters are down with the cause and, and exemplary members of the movement. Some people care, some people don't, some people are engaged, and some people are just trying to put some food on the table. Um. You know, you, you've done historical fiction with Underground Railroad. Um, you know, you, you did horror with Zone One, and now you have a, a heist novel with Harlem Shuffle. Are there other genres that you're thinking about exploring or that intrigue you or that you might end up doing at some point? Um, I guess, you know, I have switched around genres a lot. Um, I'm working on one idea now. I'm not sure if it's going to go anywhere. It's actually a romance. I've never done a romance before, so it's a... Um, a love story set on the eve of the Russian Revolution. And there are a lot of white people in it. So for research, I'm watching reruns of the Golden Girls, just binging Golden Girls episodes and taking down notes. <laughs> no, that's like a weird joke I make. I mean, Golden <laughs> Girls is an incredible historical artifact. I think if you go back and look at it now, it's really like, they're all like 50, but they, they, they try to make them look like they're ancient. It's incredible. Yeah, I, I, um, I hate those hate those sort of memes where it's like, did you know that uh, Estelle Geddes is only forty two when she did Golden Girls? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at this point they keep getting more and more hostile, right? They're like, oh, by the way, did you realize that uh, you know, Fear of a Black Planet came out, you know, fifty years ago? And you're like, no, thanks, stop yes, that, yes, please yes. no. It's a hard road. Um, so, um. The Harlem Shuffle portrays its protagonist as a kind of link between the respectable black middle and upper class in the criminal world 
but those lines blur as the, as the novel goes on. Um, how did you figure out what profession you wanted uh, your protagonist to be in order to be able to explore those kinds of relationships? I mean, was it, would it was he always going to be a fence from the beginning and that all this stuff sort of came in or, or, or you know, was it something that evolved organically? Yeah, I mean, his, his job as a fence came in very, very early. You know, I, I knew I wanted to do a heist novel. Um, who's my protagonist? Where is it going to take place? Um, and I guess in heist movies, I always hate the character of the fence. You know, the, the guys uh, and sometimes girls do all this uh, uh, heavy lifting to get the $2 million in gems. There's a shootout. Half of them are dead. Then they go to the fence and the fence is like, I'll give you 10 cents on the dollar, which always seemed like such a horrible thing. Um, so it seemed like I hate that character so much, maybe he should be the protagonist. And then I got all these, you know, weird socio sociological studies of fences from the 60s and 70s. And a lot of them will have a um, legit business out front. They'll sell like appliances or used furniture. And in the back is where they do all their illegal stuff. And then so immediately that spoke to a divided nature, um, maybe upstanding but also criminal. Um, and then, you know, as I, I do a lot of outlining, so I'm trying to figure out who all the characters are before I start and what's gonna happen. So if he has a front uh, business, what is it? Why not furniture? Um, what's his background? What's, what's the tension um, between his past, his dad was a criminal and who he wants to be, um, this upstanding businessman and family man. So that, you know, that divide itself with the fence really, you know, played out um, uh, pretty productively really early. Um, so, you know, growing, growing up as a kid, you, I got this like, uh, you know, Black History Month version of Harlem as like a golden artistic mecca. And, you know, everybody's a poet or an activist or an intellectual. And there's like, there's people, there's places and people in, in, in your book that are recognizable from that version of the story. Um, but the characters themselves also very much undermine that kind of hallmark version of the neighborhood. By, and I was wondering whether you made a conscious decision to toy around with that sort of sentimental Black History Month version or whether that was just something that emerged as, as part of the story. I mean, it emerges part of it because of my personality, but also the criminal types uh, I'm, I'm dealing with. And so um, we'll meet civil rights figures, uh, but also pimps, you know. Um, the, the Apollo Theater is there, of course, very important in terms of Black entertainment, Black politics, um, uh, but also Mount Morris Park, where all the, all the criminals dump their bodies every Saturday night. And so, you know, I sort of hate it when people are like, this book is a love story, it's a Valentine to New York. And I'm like, it has a really high body count. Um, <laughs> so it's not really a Valentine, it's... Uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to sound like it is. But, but part of the fun is having these recognizable things like the Apollo, but also things I didn't know about until I started writing the book, like about the Hotel Teresa. Um, Hotel Teresa, uh, the Waldorf of Harlem. It's where you'd go, where you'd stay in the 50s if you were a black celebrity, Joe Lewis, um, Cab Calloway. Uh, and I, you know, Walked by for, walked by the place for years and had no idea about the story of history. Of course, now it's just a converted into office buildings. The chalk full of nuts that I write about um, in the book is now a, a white castle, just to show you how far it's fallen in the last couple of decades. So there's stuff we recognize, we recognize and then stuff that I discovered and wanted to use. And then also stuff I, I make up, just like different bars and, and clubs and stuff like that. Uh, you know, related to this, there's a pretty funny bit about Juneteenth in the book. Um, did you come up with that before the like corporate embrace of the holiday, or was that just a total coincidence? It was. It was before. Um, you know, I'm always just trying to find weird hooks for set pieces or scenes, and um, I didn't really hear about Juneteenth when I went to college. You know, it was more. And I met people from the South who celebrated it, um, and I'm, the first time I heard about it, I was like. That's kind of a weird thing to celebrate. Obviously, it's a great thing, but also like you're also celebrating that you know, we're so atomized across the country that um, news doesn't travel very fast. So, what would its criminal type, the cynical type, think about Juneteenth? So, uh, but it, I did. Uh, I came up with it before, and I guess it was good timing because it did educate 
certain segment of my readers about what it was. <laughs> um, the novel portrays a lot of conflicts um, within Harlem over class, colorism, and social status. Uh, when you set out to write, did you know that you wanted, you know, even though it was a heist novel, did you know you wanted to deal with those things or did it emerge as part of sort of the, the time and, and place that you chose? It was really the, the time and place and it was very organic. Um, you know, my, my zombie novel, Zone One, uh, in that book, race does not play a factor except maybe as a joke. Um, we find out later in the book that one character is African-American and I guess the jokes that you know, we're really post-racial when 99% of the population is dead and uh, we can finally move past certain things. So sometimes that's important, sometimes not, and sometimes it emerges, sometimes uh, it's in the background. It was in the, in the front of, of, the, of my mind pretty early, I think, because once I wanted to do a heist novel, I was thinking when and where. Um, I thought 1977 blackout could be a good event my crooks could use, but it seemed very obvious. There was a race riot in the early 40s over police brutality, but Ralph Ellison sort of used that in his seminal novel, Invisible Man, so he kind of owned it. Um, and then once I decided to set it in 64 in the aftermath of a similar riot protest, um, it, was, it was in there. And how, how, in trying to figure out Carney, Ray Carney, the main character of psychology, it became another sort of external force upon him. It is race and it's class and it's power in New York City. And how do these different forces um, deform his life, deform his expectations? So it came in pretty early. Um, you know, we sort of uh, touched on this a little bit earlier, but there are some pretty scary characters in Harlem Shuffle, as in some of your previous novels. I'm thinking about Underground Railroad in particular. I mean, how do you write characters like that? I mean, I think. Well, the one that stands out to me is Pepper because he's like extremely vivid. There's, there's a scene where he's like sitting at the hotel desk and he's thinking about how terrible it would be to have a square job instead of doing what he normally does. I mean, how do you write these characters who are sort of, I, I mean, I think villainous is maybe overly simplified, but sort of, you know, terrifying. Like they're, they're, these are scary dudes. Yeah, I mean, it's really, you know, it's, you know, trying to, to do your job right. You know, I mentioned the slave master uh, Ridgeway and Underground Railroad, if he's going to be there, he can't just be like a one-dimensional villain. He has to have some inner conflict that we can maybe identify with, no matter how repellent he is. And with Pepper, um, uh, you know, we talked about inspirations. Uh, Richard Stark um, has 25 novels about a safe cracker named Parker, who's a very sort of low affect, so semi-sociopathic criminal. And those books were a big inspiration. I wanted to have a character like him in the book. So Pepper, so I, I have to inhabit him. What is, what is his reaction whenever something happens, whenever he meets somebody, a square or a criminal, someone's weaker or someone's stronger, the same way I have to figure out Ray's uh, reactions. Um, and then, you know, in the case of someone like Pepper, I actually really like him. And in the, in the sequel to Harlem Shuffle, which has come out next year, I finished this spring, Pepper gets his own novella. You know, Harlem Shuffle is sort of three novellas that tell one story. And I, I liked him so much that I needed, that I really wanted to have him have his own sort of adventure in the Carney books. And so um, even though he's not much like me at all, like I'm not really that much of a bone crusher. Um, <laughs> uh, he's, he is really fun to animate uh, once you sort of figure out who he is. And, um, and that's sort of part of the wonderful joy sometimes. A minor character can become a major character because even though it's unlikely you have some sort of identification or um, overlap with him. Um, you know, Ray and Freddie's relationship is one of the core ones in the book. They're sort of cousins, but they're really brothers. And if, you, if you've had like a really close cousin that you grew up with, you know, like how that sort of weird sibling cousin thing can work. Um, but how did you come up with that relationship? Was that something that was based on real life or was it uh, a kind of thing you you observed from other books, or you know, I, I want to have you... I wanted to have a character who would um, you know be Carney's opposite. Carney's kind of a square, so you know there are a lot of a lot of those duos of the straight man and the uh, the more freaky dude. Um, uh, the Nickel Boys have the same kind of duality between the main character Elwood and Turner, the sort of streetwise character. 
when I was writing uh, Nickel Boys and and Harlem Shuffle, my 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 brother who I was very close to in age, and you know we diverged over the years, but he was on sort of a downward decline in terms of his health, and I was thinking a lot about the brothers and like what makes one person go this way and, and, and go that way. You have the same upbringing, but you diverge at some a certain point. Why does one person survive and the other um, not survive? And so both those books are really informed by my brother and I. Um, hopefully uh, um, there's some of that love in Elwood and Turner and, and Ray and Carney. And also the irritation, you know, you, you're so close to somebody and they're so irritating. Um, how, how are you gonna, um, how are you gonna figure it out? And you, often you don't figure it out and just sort of coexist. Um, so, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of this book is sort of about um, excavating a New York that used to be. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, how did you go about researching it? Um, how did you choose the time period? Um, you know, st how, how did you, and once you chose the time period, how did you figure out how to write that version of New York, which, you know, as you make very clear, is like not the version that exists today. Yeah, I mean, um, you can go, uh, you, can, you know, you can attack the world in an allegorical way, like the intuitionist, in a fantastic way. Let's, let's fill New York with zombies, mm -hmm. or in a realistic way. And each sort of technique has its own strengths and, and weaknesses, uh, things to exploit, things to uh, ignore. Um, in this case, I knew it was going to be realistic. It was going to be a historical novel. My first couple of novels are very contemporary. And I think I ran out of things to say about how, how we live now. And so um, going to the times of slavery or, or Jim Crow and Nickel Boys or the 60s Harlem in this book has been a way for me to find a different angle on the world. Um, so it's been very, you know, very um, lovely for me to find a new way of doing it. Um, it was always going to be in New York. And then once I decided on 64 as a, as a peg for that race riot, um, I kept com coming up with capers. And so it became three more stories. And so, all right, 59, 61, 64, and I can do that. It's only five years from start to finish, but there's so much I can track in terms of the life of the city. Um, the groundbreaking for the World Trade Center happens. Uh, the civil rights movement comes to its own from 59 to 64. Um, technology is changing, we're moving from radio to TV. Um, so um, really research is, is very liberating. You know, I find things that serve the book and it's always great to get that nugget of information about Mount Morris Park or Hotel Teresa, um, something that, you know, immediately grabs you and think, oh, I can use this in a certain sort of way. Um, um, with these historic, historical novels, um, I don't rely on history books so much, but primary sources. So slave narratives, Underground Railroad, people talking in their own words. And then this book, um, newspapers. So what's happening in New York City in 1961 that I can exploit for my characters? Robert Wagner's up for re-election, so maybe I can you know, use that sort of political background. Um, and then you go to the archives of the Times. There will be an article on what's happening in New York or the World's Fair. And then the other page, a big ad for Siemens Furniture. And I can steal uh, a lot of Carney's language from the advertisements. The sad, the sad and beautiful thing about living now is that no matter how small your interest, somebody has put it on the web. And so Pinterest has like thousands of vintage catalog, catalogs from um, 1950s furniture dealers. Um, if I wanna know the language of Philco radios in the 1930s, I can find someone who's put up a how-to manual of how to repair uh, Philco and, and Zenith radios from the 30s. And so um, I don't like to leave the house and luckily all that stuff is at my fingertips now for research. Um, so Carney is a character who, uh, you know, he wants out of the criminal life, but um, you know, as Al Pacino famously said in The Godfather Part Three, they keep pulling him back in. Um, you know, what appealed to you about writing that kind of character as a protagonist? Well, c coming, coming after Underground and Nickel Boys, having somebody who has more agency uh, and can win. And so 
Uh, the heists or the robberies might not go as planned, but you know, Carney does win sometimes. I don't think that's a spoiler. And then, um, uh, uh, was it? I mean, I think all of us like those like those crime stories, and um, we will root for most terrible people if we adopt their perspective. And so, I think point of view is really important in film and 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 books. We're allied with. Michael Corleone, Walter White, Ray Carney, uh, people who can be really despicable, but since we're seeing the world through their eyes, we come around to their worldview. And so, I mean, like Dexter was a, had like six seasons about a serial killer, you know? Um, so we're, we're not these people, uh, but we can identify our own human struggle in these really despicable criminal types. Um, I'm not sure how other people perceive, let's say Marco Corleone, and his and his track. What I like about Carney is that is the struggle. Uh, I think he is. He does have these two unreconcilable, or um, he tries to reconcile his criminal nature, which you know perhaps some of us have to different degrees, and his desire for the American dream to be stable and normal in a way and uh, that he couldn't be as, as a kid, and so. I think people can identify, not just me, people can identify with that sort of uh, attempt to uh, just find your way in the world. Um, you've been dealt a, a bad hand. How do you figure out how to be? And some of those obstacles will be imposed by yourself, some by the world. Um, and I think all of us to different degrees have that kind of struggle. Um, so, Underground Railroad is already out um, and HBO Max is working on a production of an adaptation of Sag Harbor. Um, what is it like to see your work adapted for television and does it still feel like it's yours or does it, you know, what does it feel like to see um, your work sort of realize on screen, but um, in a way that is, you know, it's obviously it's not by you in the same way. Well, I, I definitely did, you know, uh... Barry Jenkins who did Moonlight and his production company uh, adapted Underground Railroad. And from the first time he finalized it, you know, I knew that it would be separate from the book. My book lives no matter how it goes. I was very optimistic. Um, and then when I actually saw it, it, it exceeded, you know, uh, my hopes for it. You know, he and his crew, producers, cinematographers, sound guys, composers, uh, the cast, really just, yeah, they spent three years pulling it together. And um, I was very moved. Um, they made changes, of course, but all the changes I, I really liked. And it made it so that I didn't know what was gonna happen next sometimes. I didn't know where this character was going or, or what they were doing. And so I got to actually experience my own book as somebody who was coming to it for the first time, which is wonderful. So um, I think that's an atypical experience. I think to have like, a really incredible artist uh, adapt your book and pull it off uh, against all odds. And so um, my personality is such that I'm really happy, but also sad that, can it be repeated? I mean, I'm, I mean, you know, there are very good people working on some other uh, options and um, uh, I'm optimistic, but- uh, Oh, are you allowed uh, to talk about that? Well, because if you um, are, you should talk about it. Is there, is there more stuff that, that, that's being adapted? Oh, uh, well, I guess, uh, I'm not sure what's, I, I mean, well, this summer I spent uh, writing The Intuitionist, like doing adaptation of The Intuitionist. Usually I write a screenplay and everybody's like, oh, it sucks, Colson, stick to novels. Uh, but this, this one's going okay. So, uh, um, and it's, it's a very different skill. You know, I, uh, I'll have Lila May in that book walk around for like 10 pages in her head. How do I get that onto the page? And for you know two and a half decades, I was like, ah, it's not my problem. And then the spring became my problem because I decided to take it on. So um, uh, nobody adapted, adapted my work pre-underground. I think I had too many black people in the book. Uh, and, then, and then since then, <laughs> I had a lot more uh, interest. So we'll see what actually comes out. I mean. It was op option doesn't mean it'll actually come to fruition, but uh, in terms of 
the intuitionist, I'm working on that now and hopefully it'll work out. It's a different thing to do and it's been fun. Um, so uh, we are going, we're, it's 7.30, so we got to, or well, 8.30 for y'all. Um, so we're going to pivot to questions from the audience. Um, and the first one is a question from John Tate. Uh, was there a specific book or short story that opened the door to reading for you? Was there a specific thing that you wrote that did the same thing for writing? Same thing for for writing. Like uh, I think they mean you know open. The, it, it's they're asking the question. You know what got you into reading, but also what made you want to be a writer. Um, in terms of like what made me want to be a writer, I was really like Marvel comics and Stephen King. You know my sisters and mom were big readers, and all the stuff they would buy would come to me in my brother's room. So Marvel Comics, uh, TV, so like The Twilight Zone, uh, made me want to like come up with weird stories about robots and fantasy worlds. In terms of short stories, like in elementary school, definitely The Lottery, Shirley Jackson, but not surprising. Um, in seventh grade, we had one of those books of short stories for seventh graders, and they excerpted the, the first chapter of Invisible Man, which is really weird, you know. Uh, uh, if you yeah, that is a mind. that is a really interesting thing to excerpt. Yeah, yeah. Like out of, out of context. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, it was just like, well, here's a weird black guy. I'm a weird black guy. Maybe I can do this thing. In terms of writing, um, like each book, I don't want to sound corny, but each book, there's a moment where where I'm like, oh, I could have done this a year ago or five years ago. Um, like I feel like I am growing as a writer and a person and uh each book there is something that i couldn't have done before so i'm still learning and being inspired and discovering new things so that's just really fun and maybe and with the say harlem shuffle it's having a very plot heavy book uh, my book sag harbor sag harbor has like no plot it's about growing up in the 80s and the most action-packed scene is when um the main character gets his braces off and then that's very different from harlem shuffle which has all a lot of different set pieces and is very plot oriented. So, you know, by switching genres a lot, I get to like try different things and then learn how to do different things in my books. And that's really lovely. So uh, here's another question from Laylee Mendelson, which I think is really interesting. Um, how do you know when the novel is finished? Oh, it's like really obvious because um, I have an outline and so I'm writing towards that last page or last image for, you know, a year or whatever. And everything, one thing that happens is everything that has to happen has happened, um, which sounds sounds simple, but every, I plotted and planned and I put everything in place. And as I got closer to the end, there's this acceleration as the mission is sort of coming to completion. But then you, then you edit and, and copy edit and move things around a little bit. And at a certain point you, you open it up and you, this is also a cliche, but you take a comma out and then two hours later, it's like, oh, I got to put the comma back in. And you can't decide anymore because the changes are so tiny and, and uh, infinitesimal, they need someone else to see it. So that's my no, when there's nothing I can really do anymore without someone else's input. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm going to try to figure some of these questions have spoilers, so I'm going to try to be creative in the way that I talk around them. Um, I found it, this is this question is from, is from C. Lu. Um, I find it very interesting that multiple main characters kept a flyer handed out from the protesters. They, they went back to read it and did not choose to discard it, but uh, put it back in their pockets. Um, what was your intention with this detail? And I think there's I, the only reason I read that whole question is because I think it's not necessarily clear what's uh, what part of the what, what's happening. Uh, if you haven't read the novel, what's happening at, at that moment? But if you could try to answer it without sure, there's uh, some political things work. happening and people are handing out flyers, uh, um, uh, calls to action, and you know, in, in some ways, it's, my characters are not very politically inclined, but they do hold on to like the flyer. What does it mean to them? They put it in their pocket and they find it a week later in their wallet. Um, so even if they're, they think they're not engaged, they're still kind of engaged. And then later on, the language of these calls to action uh, 
are sort of repurposed by my own characters to comment on what's happening to them. So um, nothing, nothing too deep, not, nothing more than what I just, what I just described, but um, there's something about the language of those political flyers from the activists that stayed with me and I wanted to figure out how to use them. And then even if some of my characters are not political, what attract, why are they attracted to these sort of fragments? Um, and they hold on to them for different reasons. Um, I'm gonna, um, so this is a question I think is, it, 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 this is a question that is about a different novel. It's about Nickel Boys. Um, and, and it's from Tangela Moore. How did you learn about the Dozier School and what about that finding inspired you to write uh, Nickel Boys or, or, you know, or, or helped inspire Nickel Boys? Yeah, well, um, I first became aware of Adam through Twitter like 12 years ago. Uh, I spent, I spent a lot, used to spend a lot of time on Twitter as goofing off. Um, in this case, and uh, I'm actually not as down on, on social media as some other people. I, I, I work alone, so I've become to went away to have a water cooler and make weird jokes and catch up on the news. I'm a news junkie and, you know, for good or ill, it's like a, can be a constant news feed. So just, it was about, it was August in 2014. And um, I heard about the story about the Dozer School, a very abusive reform school. It had closed down and they were gonna sell off the land and they found a secret graveyard of 50 something former students who'd been, some had died of pneumonia and some of them had been shot with shotguns. And I thought the story was so crazy. It was crazy that I'd never heard about it. If there's one place like that, how many other places are, are there that we haven't heard of? So the scale of it, it was a summer of, of, uh, of Ferguson and Eric Garner and, and Staten Island. So we were having yet another conversation about police brutality and I felt very powerless. And I wanted to know what the experience of the, the black part of campus of that school would be. A lot of survivors who came forward were white. Most of the people who were warehoused there were African-American. Uh, what kind of story could I get out of it? So immediately I came across this news report on Twitter and got a book out of it, so. There you go. What what's the lesson? I have no idea. But, uh, <laughs> Spend more time on Twitter. <laughs> Please don't do that. Um, we, I have a question from uh, Janet Vale. How did you come up with all the vivid descriptions of Harlem and the Harlem Shuffle? Did you have a trove of photographs to refer to? You talked about this a little bit with some of like the catalogs and stuff, but I, I think not so much necessarily about the sort of visual. Like what 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 does the Harlem of the sixties look like? It is, it is, it is, it is uh, photographs. I mean, you can you know, Google archives. If you go to YouTube and say Harlem 1964, you'll find somebody's grandmother or grandfather's footage of walking down Harlem. And I'm like, oh, a pork chop sandwich was 25 cents and write that down. They're not wearing hats, but in 59, they are wearing hats. Like what happened? And so, um, so I'm getting a lot of like small details. Then also, I mean, I think, people are pretty much the same on a hot day in 2020 what year is it 2022 2022 people in harlem are doing still doing the same thing they're sweating they're miserable um fire hydrants shaved shade. ice sorry fire hydrants shaved ice you know. yes uh so all that stuff is, is eternal and i've experienced it and and i think also writers have to project you know i have to i have to um I can invent stuff and I also have to sell it to the reader. So part of it is, is this research and figuring out what I can take. And then part of it is making it up and making it seem like it's real. Um, so uh, my next question is from Tom Levinson. Uh, are there particular craft pleasures in constructing the heist? And did you crack yourself up at any point while you were writing? I, yeah, I mean, I, you know, the two books before this one are very, grim and not a, lot of, not a lot of play and room for jokes. I like making weird jokes. And so definitely when I come up with a weird bit, I'm laughing. And then it takes two years for someone else to laugh if they do at all. But I'm crack, crack, cracking myself up. Um, and then uh, it is, there is, you know, there's one big heist and then some other sort of plot heavy shenanigans in the, in the book. 
um, and I have to make them realistic. Um, sometimes I'm like, oh, maybe we'll do that. And I'm like, that's too Scooby-Doo, man. You can't Scooby-Doo it <laughs> like, like, like that. And so, um, but the temptation is there. It is, yes, but you don't want to cheat and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to do a bad job. You don't want to get letters from people saying, actually, they didn't invent that kind of pro bar until 1972 or whatever. Oh, and you definitely will. Yes, exactly. So, um, uh, so I, I planned, you know, a bunch of heists. I have to figure out the potholes. Um, you know, I have an editor. My wife will read my book, and hopefully, people will find the holes in the argument. But I have to come up with it. That's just part of the job. Whether a book is plotless and I'm carrying it along on the character's perceptions and lively writing and uh, a philosophical point of view instead of plot, or I'm writing a plot-heavy book, I have to figure it out. So either way, I have to figure out how this book's going to work. Um, I am, it has stayed with me. I definitely am like when I'm on a freeway, like, oh, I totally dump a, bo dump a body there. You know, I'm always <laughs> looking, looking for places to dump bodies. <laughs> um, so it stays with you. <laughs> um, so I have a related follow-up question to this, which is that, were you listening to music when you were writing the high scenes? And even if you were not, and if so, what music were you listening to? And even if you were not listening to music, what would you score the heist scenes to if you were directing the movie? There, there's a few things there. So um, uh, when I write, I, I play loud music. I always have, whether it was homework or college papers or journalism or this. And it's just like 3,000 songs I like. And so it's, it's Prince and then The Clash and Sonic Youth and like Ella Fitzgerald all just one after another and they're fast and slow. So I'm always listening to music. Um, I do. Are you have one like, of those people with like a? You have just like a monster playlist that is like five days long, and you just listen to it. Yeah, it is like writing. it's like three thousand songs, and it is just goes on forever. And um, occasionally, I'll, I'll have like a secondary, like new songs that are new to me. Um, with this book, I was listening to a lot of this band called VOCs. They're kind of like a. San Francisco neo garage bands. So they, their sound has nothing to do with 50s Harlem or 60s Harlem, but it's very fast and it's very, you know, wakes you up. Um, the second part of the question about heist music, there are, you know, 30 seconds of this song and 30 seconds of that song where I'm like, oh, that's a good credit sequence music for, <laughs> for a heist movie. Um, Found a job by Talking Heads, the last 30 seconds was like an instrumental. I'm like, that's good credit music. And so I have a few things like that that are really random and uh, I can never, I'll never implement them because I'm not like a film filmmaker, but there are some songs like, oh, that's like kind of like capery, sneaking around music. Um, I have a few of those in my head. Um, I have a question from Megan Reardon. Are you ever 100% happy with your finished work? What a question for a writer. Yes, um, I, I always am, or else I would keep working on it. Um, <laughs> I think the, the older a book is, the less affection I have for it, you know, just because I feel like I don't know who the person is who wrote that book. It's so removed from like my, uh, my life now that I can't, like, why do I write a book about elevator inspectors? It seems so crazy. Um, but the last five books, definitely from Noble Hustle on, uh, and now through the sequel of Harlem Shuffle, I think they're all, I feel really proud of them. I did everything I wanted to do. There's nothing I would change. Um, uh, and I actually avoid going back to the older books. But the Intuitionist, I did, I did go back to it because I, I was writing a screenplay. And I was like, oh, actually, it is pretty good. I was pretty smart back then. I'm not sure what happened. Um, but uh, I feel really good about the last five books and I'm, I'm happy about that. Uh, I have a question from an Alexander Starling. Colson, what book have you read and loved recently? Oh, um, well, I've been in a sort of rut where I can only read for work. Um, so it's all been like New York histories and stuff like that. Um, uh, but outside of that, and I keep recommending it, so I'm, I hope I'm not boring people, but um, Patrick Radden Keefe, nonfiction writer, his last two books. Actually, there's a third one 
that came out last month. I forget what it's called. Maybe it's called Rogues, I think. But um, he's a book about the opioid crisis called Empire of Pain. And before that, a book called uh, Say Nothing about the troubles in Ireland in the 70s. And they're both just really great book, nonfiction books, um, uh, read of journalism. I tend, nowadays I'm reading less fiction and more nonfiction. I think it's, uh, it's not research, it's kind of removed from what I'm working on now. So um, it's a nice release. So. Um, I have a question from Amona Bird. She said, I read Underground and Nickel Boys. I found the ending of each of these books to be surprising and very visual. The books didn't just end, they left me with a beautiful image. Do you spend as much time on the ending of the novels as many writers do with the opening line? Well, yeah, that's no, a good question. Um, I'm, I'm glad to stay with you. Um, like in seventh grade, my teacher said like, before you write a paper, you write an outline and topic sentence and blah, blah, blah. And I do that now, but just for novels. And so I'll have a whole outline before I start writing. I have to know the beginning and the end. The middle can be fuzzy, um, but I know what the last scene is. I'm, and I'm always writing towards that last sentence sometimes I, I know in advance, but definitely I know what the philosophy of the book is and what the philosophy of the final scene is. And I'm writing toward it from the very first page, I think. Um, I think it's hard enough to find the right words each day. If you don't actually know what's, what's gonna happen, it seems crazy. And so I have an outline. Some people are like, you know, the muse comes in and guides my hands. I never know what's gonna happen. The muse does it all. I live in New York City. There could be like a track fire on a seven train. The muse can't come to work. So I'm just, I have to plot and plan. And so even before I know who Pepper is, I know what the last scene is. And so, yes, I know what that last bit is. And I feel like I'm writing toward it the same way that I don't know which I'm driving across country. I know I'm going to San Diego and not like Seattle. Um, two I'm packing for two different destinations, taking different routes. And I know where I'm going, even if I don't know exactly hour by hour which route I'm taking. Um, I'm going to hijack that question a little bit to ask a boring process question, which is when the muse can't come to work, trans down, do you make yourself sit and write? Are you one of those people? Or are you like, I'm going to go like clean the kitchen or like do some other task, and that's going to get my like brain flowing? I'm in a strange mode now because like the, the pandemic, like a lockdown broke me and basically I couldn't leave the house. So I kept working and now like I'm something's turned on where I'm like working all the time in this crazy way that it's really new for me. Um, but there are some days when I, I know, I sort of know getting up when I sit down, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna work today. Like I, and I do, I'll do whatever. I'll see a movie or goof off or, you know, whatever I do, I have no idea. But um, definitely some days I'm not feeling it and I don't force it. Um, there are some days where I know it's gonna be harder because it's like a hard scene. I haven't really figured it out, but I'm, I still have to get through it before I can proceed with the, the more fun parts. Um, and I guess I just, for most of my career, I've tried to do like eight pages a week. Not, you know, some people say write every day, but some days I don't feel like doing it or my kid has the flu and I'm just gonna watch cartoons all day or whatever. And so four or five days a week, one to three pages a day and adding up to eight pages a week seems to work for me. Mm -hmm. If I'm getting eight pages after a month, I have like 30 something. After 10 months, I have like 300. That seems to uh, take that sort of attitude, takes like the, takes the, the sad horror of writing a book and diminishes it. Like I'm not, I'm just doing eight pages a week and that's it and it adds up. Um, at, uh, at, this question is from uh, Kenny Likas. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, after you finished the Nickel Boys, you said at a reading that it and the Underground Railroad took so much out of you that you played video games for six months. Wow, that's relatable. Um, or something like that. The Harlem Shuffle, Shuffle has a lighter touch. Did writing serve some sort of, help serve some sort of personal catharsis or restoration for you? If so, how so? Well, I mean, I, I had the idea since 2014, like I said, and I, I, I set the book aside to work on Nickel Boys. 
So after Underground and Nickel Boys, I was definitely ready to have a book that would allow me to tell some jokes again. Like some of my books are funny, at least I think they're funny. Some of them are more serious and definitely, again, there's a body count in Harlem Shuffle, but there's also a lot, a lot of humor. So um, immediately I knew I was gonna return to a, a more comedic mode. And it was a much more pleasant experience than say, how do I, honor the memory of these dead kids. How do I honor, honor the memory of these people who were malformed and totally and tortured and had their lives derailed by this terrible reform school? How do I pay homage to my ancestors who were enslaved and not fuck it up? So definitely with Underground and Nickel Boys, I felt in addition to the story, I had to get it right for people who actually experienced what I was writing about. Um, and I felt none of that with Harlem Shuffle and it was very enjoyable. And I, I did not write, I did not uh, play video games after finishing Harlem Shuffle. I started this, this second book uh, that follows Ray Carney in the seventies because I thought I was having so much fun with the character. So it was very different and I, did, I needed less self care with this one. Okay, so I'm gonna be a huge nerd and ask the, the obvious question, which is what did you play when you checked out? Uh, my big book, my, my big book, my big book, my big game, I keep coming back to this XCOM, XCOM 2. Oh, man. And then um, there was one two-month streak where I did like sequels. So I did Mass Effect 2, Red Dead Redemption 2, and Divinity 2 over two months. And they're all just incredible. You know, I grew up, I was one of the first generation of who played video games. So mm -hmm. we had Pong in 75. And just to see how far they've come since then, it's just been so crazy. And you just spend a day like in Red Dead Redemption, just like hunting a deer. I'm like, can I bring some food back to camp? And it was like hunting, <laughs> bringing. Yeah. <laughs> and it really is just like a, so I feel like this real wonder in how much the, the, the community has changed and grown over the last 50 years. Yeah. Um, um, I have another question from Daniel Cosme. I, I, again, I hope I got that right. Um, Pepper and other characters seem to embody a tone of same as it ever was with regards to racial injustice and measuring this against the racial social justice movements of today, it feels discouragingly valid. How do you personally interact with this sentiment and do you find it to be inspirational or more of a fact assessment? Uh... I think fact assess assessment seems more accurate. I mean, just the way is the way we way it is. When I decide to set the final section of the book in '64, in the aftermath of a police shooting, I had no idea that the day I finished writing the whole book, uh, the George Floyd protest would start. Literally, I, I finished the book, and the next day I woke up and that CNN reporter was being arrested. Like all things, everything uh, came down that Friday. So I wasn't like looking into the future. There's just how America is. It's incredibly mm -hmm. messed up. We have a conversation about police brutality in 64, 2014, 20, uh, 2020. And we talk about it, talk about it, and then we stop. And then the next crazy fucked up thing happens and it all starts over. And that's been my life, definitely as a black New Yorker, where it's Michael Stewart, Eleanor Bumpers. Uh, growing up in the 80s, there was, Every two years, there was some sort of incident uh, in New York that was horrifying, and and then the conversation I mean, trailed off, and it comes back. So, um, uh, that's America, and we we were not equipped to change it. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, just from the perspective of of, of someone who's done a lot of research on on these events, it's striking how similar they all are. Uh, I mean, you know, like the world changes, uh, time marches on, but the, the sort of um, circumstances in which these things take place are like, you know, you can go back a hundred years ago and find people, find similar things happening and people saying the same things about those things and people saying the same things about the people, about what those people say about those things. It's really, uh, sure. it, it, it's really remarkable. Well, I mean, in terms of like, the characters in Harlem Shuffle not being some of them not being politically engaged. If if you're 50 years old in 1960, what have you seen in your lifetime? Why do you yeah. believe that this time will be different? You know, it's actually unrealistic to think that 
uh, in 64 and 65, we're gonna get these, you know, these big civil rights uh, bills. Um, so, yeah. Um, this question is from Tom Campbell. Um, what has changed the most in Harlem since the time of your book and, and, and what is still the same? And man, is that a difficult, I mean, <laughs> that's an, it would take a long time to answer, but. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's been 50 years. So there's been successive waves of like bankruptcy, you know, 1970s, New York City's bankrupt, crimes on all time high. Uh, we come out of that crisis in the 80s, the crack epidemic, gentrification, gentrification uh, rehabilitation of Harlem new people coming, come, going. So, so many different things. I think really the Hotel Teresa going from glamorous hotel with a chalk full of nuts to office tower with a white castle is the biggest sort of, is a real big signifier of what's happened. Um, I think if you are, if you're on 125th street now, Ray Carney's 125th, You'll see night. You'll see a Shake Shack and Nike Town and and uh, just the same stores you see all over America and all over the world. So Harlem's another corporate outpost. It's not a very deep thing to say. Um, what I do think is cool or interesting is that you know Harlem was a beachhead for German, Polish, Jewish immigrants in the 1880s. Uh, and then Black Americans came from the South. Uh, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, there's all been shifting populations. And now uh, 20 something white kids who are three generations removed from the first group are now coming back to Harlem. And so it's coming over again, starting over again. So I just, as a New Yorker and a New Yorker uh, armchair New York historian, I think it's so interesting how, how much does change. And, and all those people who came on the boat from Germany in 1880, and then moved out to different parts of the country, moved to suburbs, would never think that their great, great grandkids would come back to the place they fled. And that's just like one of the crazy things about America and, and how cities live. Um, I guess this may, may need to be our, our final question, but this is from Jane, Jane Cawthorn. Um, having won two Pulitzer Prizes in a National Book Award, do you feel pressure to write more award winners? Uh, no, I mean, uh, that sort of pressure is like other people's, other people's expectations or other people's expectations. I mean, um, I just try to do the best I can with each book. You know, uh, The Underground Railroad was the best book I could write when I was 45. And Harlem Shuffle is the best book I could write when I was 50. And as long as I'm not phoning it in and, and uh, not putting the work in, I'm, I'm pretty happy. Um, I think with Underground Railroad, I thought it was so crazy how it took off that it was like a once in a lifetime fluke. And then Nickel Boys had a similar sort of response. But um, I like all my books and I understand like my, my poker book isn't like, didn't sell a million copies. Like I, I'm really proud of it. And um, so I realized that over 25 years, it's not, it's not up to me. I just try to do my best. And, and sometimes people come along and sometimes they don't. Um, it's much nicer when people like the book, but either way, you know, it's done. You start the next one, you know, by the time it comes out, I'm already on some other stuff. So how do you detach your assessment of a particular book from its public reception? You know what I mean? Like how, how do you, how do you keep yourself from, from having that sort of pressure shade your perception of, of your own? I, I, I can't say I'm immune and definitely, uh, say like The Noble Hustle, my book about the World Series of Poker, it's a nonfiction book, kind of weird. Um, I'm like, oh, people don't like it. Like, is it flawed? But then I'll look at it and like, actually, this is exactly what I wanted to do. So, you know, I can't go back in time and change it. There's nothing I would change because it's actually what I wanted to do. So I, mean, I can't say I'm, I'm immune to a negative response, but then when I reluctantly go back to like the work in question and think what happened there, all I can really say is actually that's exactly what I want to do and people don't like it. <laughs> um, I actually think that's a wonderful place to end because it's uh, eight, eight o'clock for me, 9 p.m. for y'all. Yes. Um, thank you so much for doing this, Colson. Um, oh, thank you, Adam. Man. You know,
it, uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, I love the book. I can't wait to see someone turn it into a movie and, and put a very weird soundtrack to all the high scenes. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And and the muse obviously got on the bus, you know, <laughs> so somewhere along the line, you know, was not late. Um, so thank you so much for your work. Thank you for joining us to everybody watching. Thanks for being a part of this. Thanks to Miami Book Fair. And um, can't wait to see you soon in person, maybe um, in Miami the next time or we hope. Very good. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, next thank time. you so much. Good night, everybody. Thank Good you. Good night.